Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Mathematica's Washington, D.C. Conference Center. I'd like to send a special welcome to those of you participating via webinar. Before we get started today, please let me remind those of you here in the Conference Center to please join us after the forum for a networking reception right here in the lobby of the 12th floor. As Mathematica's director for the Center for Improving Research Evidence, I'm pleased to co-host today's forum with our Center for International Policy Research and Evaluation, or CIPRI. SIRE and CIPRI are two of Mathematica's five centers, and SIRE is positioned to bridge the gap between policy research and practice by offering broad expertise in a range of evaluation and research methodologies applied in diverse settings. CIPRI is at the forefront of bringing those same tools to improve public well-being in developing countries around the globe. Today, we'll focus on Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning, or MEL, M-E-L, which is an innovative approach to reconceptualizing and expanding more traditional monitoring and evaluation. I'll let CIPRI's director, Matt Sloan, talk more about that in a minute, but before we do, Please note that we're video recording today's session and we may capture some of you in the audience on film. This video will be posted on our website later this week and so to help ensure the highest possible sound quality, I'd like to ask all of our uh, participants here in the conference center to please silence all of your electronic devices. Now with that, I'll pass it over to Matt Sloan, our CIPRI director, to provide some background and to introduce our panel. Thanks, Anne. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome our guests here today, too, as well as uh, many folks joining us by webinar. And I'm thrilled to moderate today's session. Uh, before we jump in, though, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about our Center for International Policy Research and Evaluation, which is one of Mathematica's newest centers. CIPRI um, advances Mathematica's mission by supporting, promoting, and disseminating the company's growing international work. That work started uh, back in 2003, and since then we've partnered with governments, multilateral donors, foundations, universities, and nonprofit organizations to design and implement uh, rigorous, complex um, evaluations of social programs in developing countries. That commitment recently led to the creation of a separate division of over 50 researchers here at Mathematica who focus solely on international development program evaluation and technical assistance to address the growing needs for evidence-based solutions to improve the lives of people in developing countries. Today's forum will focus on one of the tools that we use, um, Monitoring Evaluation Learning, or MEL, which emphasizes comprehensive performance monitoring, selective evaluation, and continuous learning. Several organizations, including many focused on international development, have fostered and developed uh, a MEL approach. While more traditional monitoring and evaluation, or M&E, tends to focus on producing data for accountability or to gauge impact, MEL engages key decision makers to prioritize learning questions, apply the most appropriate and credible tools and methods for addressing those questions, and then intentionally seeks to incorporate learning into program delivery. Our panelists will discuss how foundations and federal um, agencies have adopted MEL approaches, They'll share their experiences in applying those principles and consider how MEL techniques can be generalized to help other organizations improve programs and understand their impacts. Let me take a moment to introduce our panelists. Today we'll hear from Nancy McPherson, Managing Director for Evaluation at the Rockefeller Foundation, who will be joining us remotely from her office in New York. We have Jackie K. Williams, Director of Research and Evaluation at Wellspring Advisors, who will talk about how funders work with grantees to incorporate MEL concepts into their program. We have Joshua Kaufman from USAID. Josh will talk about the Global Development Lab, which is working to develop new measurement approaches to foster learning. And then my colleague, Clemencia Cosentino, will talk about the role of researchers in developing learning partnerships with funders and implementers. Now, I'm pleased to invite Nancy um, to offer her remarks. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, Anne, for um, inviting me, and I'm really sorry I can't be there in person. 
Um, in, in starting up, kicking off the, the panel, I'd like to do uh, two things in terms of framing the way I think about um, monitoring evaluation and learning. And hopefully this will help to provoke some discussion um, largely about where our profession is in, uh, in the evolution of thinking about how we respond to the needs in the context of the world around us. Um, I think it's helpful to think about the fact that we in the evaluation world or the monitoring and evaluation world or the monitoring and learning evaluation world, and right there we've got a bit of an identity uh, uh, issue to talk about. We're at a moment in time in the evolution of our profession. And I suggest that we need to put the, the MEL construct in the context of where we've come from in terms of our profession. I think it's useful to have a quick look back to see where we've come, where our profession has come from in order to think about where we are now, what MEL means now, and where we're going. Because undoubtedly the pendulum swings in various directions in various decades. So just very quickly, I mean, evaluation has been a profession since the, the 1950s and 60s, where it was based on social science, empirical research, rational thinking, experimental design, largely led by federal governments and academic research. And then the other, the other stakeholders followed. The 70s and 80s ushered in the participatory voice era. Robert Chambers, qualitative data, and new public management. The 1990s and 2000s brought the wave of evidence-based policy and more of the participatory inclusive approaches. Experimental design was still seen as the gold standard, and efforts to standardize were popular as well. So this last decade, where, we are, where I think we are now, is what we're calling the data-driven decision decade, with a focus on timeliness, near-term results, innovation, and the use of new technology. It's basically our profession is having to recognize what's happening around us with the need, the pressure to know things sooner, quicker, make them look more interesting in visualization, make them stand out more quickly than, than we would normally take in uh, some of our deeper studies. That pressure on our M&E processes is also to integrate learning along the way, to inform decision making on a regular basis and not just at midterm and final evaluation time. So I think this decade, more than any other, is seeing a real challenge to what we're calling traditional evaluation methods and approaches. And in, in thinking about this, and I'll, I'll be interested in your responses, I would posit that probably we've not been keeping up and adapting to changing times, uh, needs, and the potential of technology around us. Or, on the other hand, is it just a fad and the pendulum will sw swing back? Will we be in, pre in, in decades to come being look at deeper studies again, the need for deeper understanding and learning? The second trend I want to discuss is, and I'm hoping my, my colleagues in DC can bring up this slide. Just, can someone tell me if you can see the slide yes, yes. there? Yes. OK. All right. So you don't need to see any of the detail on this slide. But basically, the second trend that I think monitoring evaluation and learning is needs to respond to is that there are we're in an unprecedented era of other forms of finance for global development and new players. So this slide is showing, this is the G8 task force on impact investing, showing the amount of available finance for global development. And this, this came out last year, and the G8 have, and OECD have been having a hard look at what other forms of financing are out there. Well, if we stop and think about where our profession has been, We've been looking at the bottom band. So the bottom band, you can see the blue band, that's, that's largely official aid flows. So the development evaluation world has largely been focused there. The gray band in the middle, the large band, um, is the impact investing world. These are investors that want to invest for a finance return and a social return. Um, they just want their money to do good things. Uh, and the green band, uh, our remittances, and I was, I was amazed when I saw the size of that. And we just, so we don't play in those spaces. 
uh, our profession has come from. We've come from the band on the bottom of this. So partly when we think about monitoring, learning, and evaluation, we need to think not only about the development evaluation space, but we need to think of some of these new spaces. Um, how do we monitor and learn for early stage work? Innovation, proof of concept. And I know that Josh and Jackie will talk, will talk about this because this is some of the work that foundations are involved with and certainly the uh, innovation folks at USAID. So I hope, so uh, the foundation that I work for very much works in the impact investing space. And our monitoring, evaluation, learning work has had to adapt pretty, pretty drastically from the kind of development evaluation um, that, that we pretty much know as mainstream in our profession. I'm going to leave it there and hope that both the context setting of the era that we're in, as well as the new players and the new forms of finance will trigger some broader discussion about how do we monitor, learn, and evaluate in the, the time we're in. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, now I'd like to uh, turn it over to Jackie, share her thoughts with us. Thank you. Um, before I start, I know I can't do this for people joining on the webinar, but just for those of you who are in the room, could I see, do we have any funders in the room? And do we have researchers and evaluators in the room? And then do we have program implementers? program staff of programs that might be the focus of evaluation. Okay, that's helpful. Um, so I want to talk about this in the context of a funder-grantee relationship. But those of you who are researchers and evaluators, um, we all know that in that role, we often are mediating the relationship between funders and the programs that are being evaluated. So I think there's an important role for you to play as we think about the most useful approach. And I come at this because having been in philanthropy for the last 15 years after spending the first half of my career being a social scientist and doing in the field research and evaluation, one of the things that I've realized is that funders have a wonderful ability to make evaluation more challenging and in the process to make our grantees crazy. And so in the spirit of asking for your help as we try and mitigate that, I want to tell you one of the things that seems key to me. And I always start with questions. And I will do that again. Because I think one thing that often happens with evaluation, and funders often are responsible, is that we don't start with questions. We ask the wrong questions. And we ask too many questions. So by not starting with questions, I mean that evaluation conversations tend to begin with either methods or a matrix. And neither of those are a good starting point for evaluation. When you say, what's your evaluation plan, or you get a proposal for a grant, and the answer to how are you thinking about evaluation is, we're going to do a survey, we're going to do a case study, we're going to do pre-post, we are not going to do an RCT, but we'll do just about anything else that you want us to. Um, that's the wrong starting point. When you start an evaluation with, please fill out this five-page matrix with a gazillion indicators, that's the wrong starting point. So we really ought to be starting with questions. First question for any evaluation ought to be, what's useful to learn here? And then methods and approach follows from that. And that's something that if funders are not opening the conversation with, I think researchers and evaluators um, should try and call them out on that. And I think you also should help implementing organizations be more comfortable in saying, wait, before we talk about how the evaluation is going to be done, um, could we talk about what it's going to focus on and what the questions are? And then I think the reason for that is pretty clear, but it also can be useful if you just give examples. Because once you say, you know, what are we interested in here? Are we interested in can quality be maintained in a different geographic or cultural context? Are we interested in does this program 
equally engage men and women, or boys and girls, if we're interested in will the outcomes endure. Those are all very different questions. They're going to have different approaches, and we just too often don't start with identifying the core set of questions that we want to explore. And then, even when we do ask questions, we funders and others, we tend to ask the wrong questions. And speaking from a funder perspective, this often has to do with a funder's, again, wonderful inability to think in a common sense way about time frame. Funders very often ask for three or four year outcomes with one year grants. And if you do that, then the evaluation questions are going to be the wrong questions and you're going to end up with something that's not useful. In a more specific example from our own work at Wellspring, we had in our um, grant application materials a question that I lobbied not to ask. And I lost that. Sometimes even the director of research and evaluation um, doesn't win the battle against a program team that's comprised of strong human rights advocates. Um, but the question was, how will you measure your progress? And I lobbied against that question because I do not like using the word measure. I think it has a particular connotation for people. And at the end of the day, I got the question changed because I did an analysis of about 150 proposals, half of which had been submitted before we changed our guidelines, half of which were submitted after we changed our guidelines. And in the first set, before that question was introduced, in talking about their evaluation plans, about 17% of the proposals identified numbers of. We are going to assess our progress or we're going to evaluate by documenting the number of, and then they would list the things they were going to count. And counting things sometimes is a meaningful evaluation tool and approach. It's not always, and too frequently what you're counting just isn't meaningful or isn't counted well, and so it's not very useful information. So 17%. Once we started asking the question, how will you measure your progress, it doubled fully one-third, 34% of all grant proposals now were telling us that their evaluations would be done by counting the number of things. So questions and words really matter, and it changes the usefulness of the information you get. And then finally, we asked too many questions. I think there um, is an interest in wanting to learn about everything. And I think this is one cautionary point I'll make about shifting to an agenda that focuses more on learning. Um, you still need to be mindful of getting good quality analysis about a shorter set of questions than getting shallow, not very useful or credible analysis about a lot of questions. And so I think figuring out how many questions to ask in what sequence and at what time is also really important. So I think we should start with questions, we should try and ask better questions, and we should limit the number of questions that we ask. And then the final point I want to make is that we don't often think about the fact, but I really truly believe this. Funders and grantees actually have similar challenges related to evaluation. Both often have limited expertise, time, and resources. It's funders as well as grantee organizations. And so funders are supporting grantees in doing something that we as funders struggle to do well. And so I think it's important to keep that in mind. And the cautionary note here about learning is that as we've talked more about evaluation should be for learning and not just about accountability, I think that there has been an inaccurate perception that somehow if evaluation is used for learning, it's easier. And it doesn't need the same rigor or systematic approach. And obviously, I don't think that that's true. I think that um, it needs the same quality of other evaluations. It's hard. And it's not easier just because it's for learning, which sounds like something that would be awfully easy to do in any room with any group of people. And so, yes, I agree that 
programs implementing the work should own the evaluation. It's something that should be done with them and not to them. That's incredibly important. I think it has been an important shift in the field that we have become better at engaging the people who are doing the work um, and that the relationship often is the primary relationship is between the evaluation team and the program team and not necessarily with the funder and I think that's as it should be but at the end of the day I think we also push grantee organizations beyond their capacity evaluation and research is something that does require at some point expertise it's something that we do as a profession and there's a reason to have us on board we can bring something to it that's more than any grantee organization should be expected to do on their own. And so I think it's important to expand the agenda to include learning, but I think we have to um, continue to provide the resources that organizations need and not leave them out there on their own because this sounds like something they ought to be able to handle. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Josh. All right, thank you very much. So I guess I should start by saying, and it probably goes without saying, that, that USAID has never driven any grantee crazy, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to get that out there I for the record. <laughs> uh, so um, I, the second thing I want to say is actually I'm a huge fan of this shift from ME to MEL. Um, and at USAID, sometimes we throw an R in for research to make it MERL. Um, and the reason I'm excited about it isn't so much for the acronym per se, but really sort of what it implies. Um, you know, a, a sort of more traditional monitoring and evaluation framework that's based primarily on, at least, and this is from a USAID perspective, sort of feeding into our reporting structures, and also, again, from the accountability, accountability perspective, is actually oftentimes strangely divorced from the actual implementation of projects. Um, and so in my mind, what this shift to, to MEL or to Murrow really implies is breaking down the wall between project implementation and project planning and sort of learning and monitoring evaluation. And I think that's sort of where the action is. And not to say that, that we don't want to know the impact of our programs from a reporting perspective, that we obviously we want to be transparent. And from a US government perspective, we have a fiduciary responsibility. So those, those sort of old approaches are still just as important. Um, but I feel like it's this new area that's, that is, again, is sort of where, where the action is. Um, but to do that implies a pretty significant cultural change, and not just within uh, funding organizations or donors like USAID, um, but all of your organizations as well. Um, you know, for example, and I'll talk a little bit more detail about this, we're starting to try to push more developmental evaluation. Well, it turns out project implementers actually aren't that excited about having a full-time external evaluator embedded into their project, lo and behold. Um, so it really is a big cultural shift, not just sort of for donors or funders, but across the board. Um, and I think it's an area where USAID is, is making a real push to try to find that right balance between the reporting, the accountability, and the learning. I think it remains to be seen how successful it will be. I think it'll be tough, but I think we're really pushing in the right direction. Let me just give a couple of examples how we're doing that, but then I want to shift to mostly talk about some of the new tools that we're developing to try to uh, improve our odds and, of success. So many people probably know that um, the, our first evalu policy that USAID had under our sort of new policy bureau was actually our evaluation policy, which is now five years old, and I think was an important move towards um, seeing evaluation as an important, learning as an important component of evaluation. So I think it was sort of a, a necessary but not yet sufficient move. And I think it'll really culminate this year, uh, towards the end of the year, we should be issuing new guidance, policy guidance, for our sort of internal work across the whole program cycle, what we call starting from strategic planning, going through project design, implementation, and evaluation, that will really have a tremendous focus on uh, learning and adaptive uh, management through programs. And I think that will actually be maybe even a more important shift than the evaluation policy, per se. Um, uh, and we've been taking some, I think, important baby steps as well. We, we had an external assessment of the quality of our evaluations. We're starting to push more action plans that are forcing uh, our operating units and our project managers to say ahead of time how they're going to use the evaluations and feed it into the projects. What I wanted to do mostly, though, was talk about uh, some of the tools that we're in the early stages of developing and testing that, like I said, hopefully will increase our odds, our collective odds, at succeeding in this shift. Um, 
So when the lab was uh, initiated a couple years ago, um, we had really a two-part mandate. And so the first part was um, to source new approaches, new innovative approaches to solve long-standing development challenges, infant mortality, food insecurity, et cetera. But the second was to sort of do the same thing, come up with new approaches and solutions that would improve the quality of the development enterprise, as we call it. In other words, that would um, improve our effectiveness and our efficiency. And we thought from the early stages that M&E, or Merle, was really crying out for this sort of innovation. For a lot of the reasons that have already been talked about, um, you know, that we do want to make it more relevant to projects themselves, but also for other reasons that maybe aren't quite as central to MEL. But, for example, the real explosion of real-time data systems, mobile connectivity, and other technologies that have huge implications for how we do MEL, um, as well as just an acknowledgement that donors are working in a whole variety of environments and complex settings. Um, and so more traditional tools like even impact evaluation or performance evaluation aren't always the best tools to measure some of the programs or the impact that we're looking at. So, so we decided that we were going to try something out to see if it worked, which was use some of the tools that we had developed to source these innovations for you know, off-grid solar, that sort of thing, and try to source innovations for monitoring, evaluation, research, and learning. Um, so we brought together last summer uh, 30 organizations, um, sort of a very diverse set of organizations, um, some large USAID implementers, some folks that have been doing m and for USAID and other donors for a long period of time, but also a lot of universities, think tanks, and some of like Mathematica and other organizations that sort of are, have a, a more methodological sort of rigorous focus. We brought those folks together with some other donors and other parts of USAID, and we spent about three days brainstorming to see if we could come up with new ideas. And we came up with a lot of really good ideas, and USAID uh, narrowed it down, and we funded five of them. And so this is a program that we call Merlin, which some of you may have heard of, which is Monitoring, Evaluation, Research, and Learning Innovations. We had to have a good acronym. Um, and the way we're going to treat these programs, and I'll briefly describe them in a minute, um, is the same way we would treat any other innovation, which is uh, we're going to test them. And we're not going to assume ahead of time that any of them are going to be successful or, or will work. And so we'll be rigorous and objective. Um, and we'll subject them to tests. And so some of these five might end up being significant improvements. So we're not really necessarily looking for incremental improvements, but significant improvements over the way that USAID and other donors are able to do MEL or MERL. And those that, that do show that promise, then we would work um, particularly with our learning evaluation research office in the agency that's partnering with us um, to make these approaches available to all of USAID. But we're also in constant contact with other donors and foundations because you know, the reality is, is almost any funder, development funder, regardless of whether they're public sector or private sector, does m and &E for largely the same reasons um, with largely the same tools. So we're hoping that any successful approaches we develop will be applicable well beyond USAID. So let me just briefly uh, describe them. I'll take a couple minutes because uh, I don't want to go over my 10. Um, so the first is, uh, is uh, based on the concept of rapid cycle evaluation. We call it uh, rapid feedback moral. And the idea would be if you have a project with a pretty clear theory of change and you have, say, multiple implementation arms, like say you had a rural um, literacy program that was focused, had a technology component, you know, maybe a textbook component, a working with parents and families and training teachers. They, what you could do is essentially do mini RCTs, say every six months, to compare those four arms against each other and against a control group. And you would be able to then, if successful, if this approach was successful, determine which parts of the program were performing better than others. And then in an ideal situation, if it was really cut and dry, you would stop implementing the parts that weren't effective and you would put an increasing amount of your resources against the things that are working better. So the idea is that ultimately your project would have more impact at the end of it. So that's an approach that is fully embedded into the, the L part, right? It's not about post facto, it's not about reporting, it's all about building it into the, the project cycle. Likewise, we have a project around developmental evaluation, which obviously we didn't invent. Uh, Michael Quinn Patton and other people did. Um, but it really hasn't been used that often in development and almost not at all at USAID. And so we thought it was a great opportunity to actually test out whether developmental evaluation was an effective tool for development programs. Uh, it will say what it is, yeah. So developmental evaluation is uh, the simplest way to describe it is you embed a full-time evaluator into the program. Or it could be into an organization, but in our case, it would be most likely into a program. Um, and, and, that and the 
the, it's actually neutral or agnostic when it comes to the method, right? So the rapid feedback has a clear method built into it. Development evaluation, you design your method to be consistent with whatever the sort of context and the system is that you're operating in. So in some respects, it's the opposite side of the same coin, where you're building in evaluation into the program, but you're doing it in a setting where, say, your theory of change might be very uncertain or subject to change. And ahead of time, you might not even have a clear idea of what your project implementation is going to look like. Um, the next one we call balanced moral, which actually gets at a lot of the things that Jackie was talking about uh, that does drive people crazy. So I admit we sometimes drive people crazy. Um, and it's really built off some of the great work that MIT has done around lean research. And the idea is to expand that out of just the R and put it into the M and the E and the L. But it's really about sort of right-sizing our approach and making it relevant, um, really be sensitive to local stakeholders in particular. Um, and so I guess you know one theory or one example of how we might do this is that you know, if a USA admission and a lot of our missions do household surveys, for example, and rarely do those surveys shrink, right? Because each year there's sort of the fight because there's so much we want to know. Let's put that question in. Let's put that. Oh well, maybe we could put some democracy stuff in there. It doesn't just have to be about health or just about agriculture. Um, or you know, the State Department is now really interested in X. So let's put some. And pretty soon, of course, it's an instrument that's almost cruel to the people that we're hoping that would sit down and spend hours and hours. Um, so the idea is really to right size. Um, the next one is, uh, we call it spaces, and but really that's about, it's a series of tools that are uh, used um, in complex settings. And sort of it's really a, a complexity where monitoring, systems thinking, social network analysis. Um, and that's that gets somewhat past just the, the MEL construct in that it's designed to be used throughout the program cycle. So it could be used for, for strategic planning or program planning as well. It doesn't just have to be an evaluation uh, component. And then the last one, which is the newest one, we don't have any pilots yet, um, it's just getting started, is a, a program called Expanding the Reach of Impact Evaluation. And this one is, um, this one will be interesting because this is, if you think about sort of innovation stages, this is a very early stage idea. And the idea of Erie is to go back to a program, say, five or ten years after it ended. And it would be a program that would have to have a fairly discrete control and treatment group. It could be a geographically discrete group. It could be within a population or population subgroups. But to see if that we could use existing data or information that was created over the period of time after the project ended, um, so you know, large data sets, satellite imagery, et cetera, to see if we could uh, see if the impact of the U.S., in this case, the USAID intervention, has sustained itself over the five or 10 years after. And that, as like I said, that's early stage because, one, we have to test to see if there's a, enough projects that meet those criteria. But it's also proof of concept because there's somewhat of a collective action problem in the sense that, that everyone recognizes that it's really important that we go back and see if these things are sustainable. But just the way that we're structured, um, it's not in anyone's individual interest to do that because usually the you know, that mission might no longer be working in that sector, or the person that designed that program has now gone over two or three other assignments over the last five or 10 years. Um, so this will be an interesting uh, uh, case study for us. So in all these cases, um, we're looking to take about the next three years or so to do pilots, test them out. Um, and like I said, the ones that are successful, if any of them are, hopefully more than one will be, that we would look to scale it within USAID and other donors beyond. So I think that's 10 minutes. Great, thank you, Josh. Mm -hmm. uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Clemencia to offer her thoughts. Thank you very much. So uh, these prior presentations um, provide a great context for the topic that I'm covering. Um, in fact, Nancy's uh, phrase evolutionary moment really resonated with me uh, in terms of this process of evolution from m and &E into male over time with Jackie adding that it's with grantees, not to them, and funders, with funders, not to them. So it's highly collaborative. Um, and the topic that I'm covering today is the role of researchers in this highly collaborative uh, exercise. Um, and in thinking about this role, and in fact, in talking to a lot of my colleagues here at Mathematica who are engaged in male efforts, uh, we brainstormed a little bit about what we felt was our role as researchers for our projects. And the first conclusion was that that role varied greatly because of the needs of the project. It's very much tied 
to the goals of that project and the context in which that uh, project or program is being implemented. But we still felt there was a lot of commonality. And we came up with a definition that you should be able to see on the board here. Um, and that definition, uh, I hope to persuade you today, after I finish my remarks, not that necessarily it is the right definition, but it, that it is a really good starting point for thinking about how we collaborate as researchers in MEL efforts with our grantees, with funders, and also with folks in, on the outside. So that definition reads, a learning partner is a critical, lifelong, and highly adaptable colleague that drives a broad learning agenda. So it's got five elements. The learning partner is uh, a critical, lifelong, highly adaptable colleague that drives a broad learning agenda. So there are five elements that I would like to go over. Um, you're going to hear the word learning a lot. I think it's also been mentioned before. And it's because it's at the very core of what MEL is. Um, of course, these are all highly related comments, but there are some features of them that are very salient. So let me begin with the very last one, because it's the one that drives the definition. We feel that in male learning, is more, um, it's broader. And I think, uh, Josh, you mentioned that as well. It's not just about learning at one fixed point in time for evaluation purposes. This, it's the right time to evaluate this program. It's learning, it's identifying opportunities for learning and opportunities that are not just about measuring impacts or even just measuring outcomes, but any form of learning that could drive improvements to the program over time. And some of the examples that Josh gave uh, are great. In, in m and &E, in more traditional m and &E, we, we think of learning in the service of the evaluation in the sense that we may do a mixed methods design, but the qualitative aspects of the mixed methods design may be there so we can search for explanations for the quantitative findings, the impacts that we measured, and we need to understand them. Um, in this case, it's all, it's all learning that's being driven for some purpose that, for the program, to improve it or for accountability or to meet a particular need of, say, a board. So the learning is really at the core, and it is the engine for program improvements. Uh, for tweaking it, as you described a minute ago, or for making really important decisions at different points in time. Now, in that role, the definition reads, it's a colleague that drives this learning agenda. We, we work very closely with the donors. We're not just the person that, you, that somebody comes to to say, this is time to evaluate. We get some guidance, and we run with it but rather we work very closely with the donors and often with the grantees as well. We may be part of the conversation early on, but once we do our work, we also talk about the implications and we participate in decision making regarding program improvements. We serve as staff extenders sometimes at the beginning of a program, for example, if program officers need support with reviewing proposals. Uh, we may um, help the male um, staff member at a foundation to review mail plans from the grantees and help them improve them, to begin with things like, what's your research question, <laughs> which I agree with you, it's oftentimes lacking, and it should be the first thing that's asked. Uh, we also provide technical assistance to grantees, and we sometimes may identify others. Doesn't mean that we have to wear every hat and do everything, every piece of learning. It could be that we, we generally come up with a strategy and we may identify grantees that are in a good position to do the work or external individuals, such as consultants. So that, that, um, that colleague role, taking you back now one step to, in, through that definition, has to be very adaptable. Because if the whole point is program improvements or it's meeting information needs, those needs might change or the program might be tweaked. And we have to be prepared to tweak our plans. We don't come up with a design that then we execute and we produce a report, but rather we're part of a cycle, of a program cycle, and we have to accompany that cycle and adapt as needed to the different needs of the programs and also of the different audiences. Um, and that also means that we do it through the life of the program. Um, we're there sometimes at the very beginning, 
I, I personally find that one of the most exciting moments to be sort of a strategic advisor and to partake on, in the, on the decisions of, of how a program is set up. Some, we often don't do that, um, but come in once, once a foundation or a funder has an idea and they want to put a program in place and help with its implementation, as I described before, as a colleague or a capacity extender. Um, and then at key stages, we wear an evaluator's hat. We may evaluate certain outcomes or impact at different points in time that are helpful for that particular uh, effort. But we need to remain critical throughout this whole effort. And that's sort of the first word that shows up there, learning partner that is critical. And what I mean by that is that we've become colleagues. We've built relationships. We've had dinner and wine together. And now <laughs> I've got to hand you some bad news. Uh, <laughs> And we have to do that. And we have to retain a certain level of objectivity to be able to help the program, because it's all about the learning. And so that's what I began with. And I think that's the key driver of our work as researchers and our contribution to the program that has to be highly collaborative. Um, but at the same time, we need to remain a critical colleague, or as sometimes we're called, a critical friend. Um, so I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Clemencia, and thank you to everyone for uh, such uh, interesting presentations. Um, at this time, I'm going to pose a, a few questions to the panelists to uh, start the conversation, and then after a few minutes, I'll go ahead and open the session up to questions here uh, in Washington, D.C., as well as uh, on the webinar. Uh, for those on the webinar, you can submit questions to our speakers um, at any time using the Q&A widget um, on the platform. So why don't I um, start, and I, I want to, a couple of you, I think, mentioned Nancy's very provocative statement about uh, us being at a, a moment in time, um, a, a revolutionary moment, an identity crisis. Uh, and I'm wondering if um, we take as an assumption that funders, implementers, and evaluators all have as a basic common goal to improve public well-being at the end of the day. Um, what advice do you have in kind of charting a future through this this moment into kind of the next step so that this just isn't just a fad that, that swings one way to the next? And maybe I could ask Nancy to um, kick us off. Thanks, Matt. Yes, I'm here. I'm just thinking. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, it, it's, I think it is exactly the right question in terms of where we are and where we're going. Um, and from the second slide that I, or from the slide that I showed with the, now the range of, of different actors and players in this, uh, I think we need to do a bit of a reset in terms of how we actually approach both the field but also the partners that we're actually working with. Um, it's been challenging, it's certainly it really interesting, challenging, and stimulating for me at the Rockefeller Foundation to have to do this, to work with partners that aren't the traditional partners. So one thing is expanding, expanding our horizons to reach into some of those other bands that were on my slide. Who are those players? You know, when you go to the Social Capital Summit in San Francisco in the fall, all the impact investors. They've never heard of the American Evaluation Association. They've never heard of the professional associations that we uh, associate with. So we need, we need new partners. We need to build bridges between, uh, between these sectors. And then I think Josh hit on a lot of the, the new tools and approaches that we need for the early stage work, for innovation work. Um, and I think we basically just have to get with it. I frankly feel we're, we're pretty far behind in most of, the, most of our profession. Um, and we need to uh, really uh, hurry and hustle and uh, uh, find new friends and new peers and figure out how to be uh, relevant uh, in some of those other spaces. Other? I have just one comment about the role of an evaluator, which is um, the other thing that I think probably would be helpful 
if we could end once and for all the debate about are you a researcher or are you an evaluator? <laughs> and so this is a debate that as Nancy was speaking about AEA, I remembered that in the 90s um, there was a big doodah at AEA and all of the quote unquote researchers left and joined APM. <laughs> and, and I remember a point in the late 90s when I'm pretty sure I'm the only individual who was a member of both <laughs> and felt that both the policy group and the American Evaluation Association were helpful as affinity groups and colleagues. Um, and I do think that this shift to learning is probably helpful in bridging that, where people will stop looking at researchers as just academics who can't contribute to a learning agenda, and evaluators will stop being looked at as just people who do qualitative stuff that can't really bring the rigor that you need. So I hope that will be an outcome. I think that's a great question. I think it's easy to answer that either from a glass half empty or a glass half full perspective. Because I think ultimately you're right in the sense that all of those actors that you listed, all of us, what we have in common, right, is that we're, we're in this to improve development outcomes and improve lives. Um, but that doesn't mean that everyone's going to agree on what the evidence is or the value proposition. I mean, I think about, you know, I spent most of my career at USAID in the democracy human rights space, right? And that there are some aspects to that sector that find evidence somewhat neuralgic because they're doing something that's a public good, right? Like, I don't care if human rights is effective or not. It's human rights. You're going to tell me I should stop doing human rights? And so I think we have some aspects of that throughout development. Um, and so I think there it's, it's really um, trying to sort of come to that common place, like you said, which is, you know, it's not, we're not, it's not a dollar here or a dollar there. It's how do we make this process more effective. Um, I think one thing that I find really interesting, and I'm, I don't know this is necessarily the end-all be-all for anything, for everything, but is that, that you know, when you have organizations like JPAL and Evidence Action that are sort of almost merging the evaluation and the implementation into a single model, like I find that sometimes to be really powerful, and you know, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see if that's a trend that, that grows to some of the larger uh, development implementers. So what I wanted to say is what resonated with me about that word evolution is that it feels like a very natural shift and a very needed shift. Um, I remember the first time that, that uh, this idea, that I came across this idea of a male partner. I, I sort of started my career in with a more traditional m and &E space. Uh, and my first question was, well, how is that different? Um, and over time, I've realized that it's different in very powerful ways because it enables a level of integration that creates efficiencies and promotes learning that is just not there in the traditional space. And I think the examples you gave were excellent examples. And I think it's instructive for other funders. There are still a lot of federal government agencies that are in tra this traditional m and &E framework and that create monitoring data systems on one end, to monitor outcomes over time, and then they do evaluations at different point in time, and and even OMB has been reacting to these and saying this doesn't make any sense. We need greater integration and a greater understanding of how these pieces contribute to a whole. And to me, that's the evolution right there: is that now we have a much greater understanding of how these pieces come together uh, to support a much more robust learning agenda. I, I would just chime in also that I think um, uh, the focus on use that everyone has mentioned, you know, what are you going to use the evaluation for? What purpose are the findings going to serve? If, if there's a real explicit focus on use, I think that will help us to get through this evolutionary period. Now, that's not to say that everyone's always going to agree about what, what would be most useful. I mean, I think Josh's point earlier about, you know, funders having a fiduciary responsibility is always going to require sort of some approaches that in some ways, directly or indirectly, we've sort of been disparaging. Um, but if you can be explicit about it, why are we doing that, then I think that will help us to sort of work through this evolutionary period. Let me um, pose a, a second question. Um, 
Jackie, you reminded us of the important of the question, uh, importance of the question. Um, starting with the question, asking the right questions, and limiting the questions to what are what are useful. Um, I'm, I'm wondering from your perspective, how do you see Mel as accomplishing that, I think, fairly challenging um, goal? If you're going to add the word learning, then it just seems that starting with what's useful to learn here would be a natural first step. Um, you know, I, the first time I made the remarks that I made today probably was about 10 years ago in a blog piece. And so this is a pretty consistent theme for me. And I think that shows that it's been true, at least in my view, over various phases of evaluation and not just this new one. Um, it just seems like such a straightforward thing that any time when you're talking about any level of evaluation, you start. I'm a huge advocate of Merlin, having just learned about it because of this panel, which makes me really excited, because I actually believe that his suite of approaches reflects the fact that they understand that you're asking different types of questions, and therefore need different approaches based on that. So I think that's a really great example, and that if we get that model out there, I think it will be easier for people to understand, oh, if I want to learn this, I should maybe try something like this. And if I want to learn this, this one. I think I, first of all, I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I will say that, that um, I think that this shift even independent of Merlin, but this shift to MEL will, should make us all much better about answering the right questions. Or at least, you know, when we're doing, when we're doing evaluation for sort of traditional purposes of post facto evaluation, whether it's an impact evaluation or performance evaluation, it's not so much that we're answering the wrong question. I think we're always answering the same question over and over again. It's just not necessarily the question that's as, re as relevant for, or as we would want, or that enables us to learn as much as we want. Um, and so I think that one of the most exciting things about the shift is exactly that, is starting with the question instead of starting with the tool. Also helps send the right signals to grantees. Grantees tend to want to know what is it that the funder wants to see. Uh, and they look for that data point that is compelling and that tells the funder, gee, you should renew this award. <laughs> so I think that, I think that it also is the right framing. So they start thinking about it and, uh, and begin with the learning question. Nancy, would you like to add anything? Sure. Um, I think, you know, keeping, keeping in mind the, the context the era that we're in, I think our, our profession uh, also has a, an obligation to keep an eye on the integrity of the, the levels of the questions and the integrity of the data that is being collected for those questions. Um, I think we have a real challenge. Uh, I mean, it's absolutely undeniable we need to get things quicker and make sense of it and harness technology around us. But in some cases, we're using, um, we're using monitoring data to answer evaluative questions, and that seems like just fine with <laughs> some organizations. Um, it's self-reported data. It's, it's very different kinds of data. But we have to, I think, be the stewards of what kinds of questions, what kind of data uh, do we need to answer the questions that uh, both our own organizations need. Um, and really try and dig deeply into uh, what we've all learned about uh, the quality of data, about data integrity, uh, about correlation, about causality. Um, I think we can't just sort of abandon all of that. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm looking through my screen here at uh, Josh and some of his colleagues at, uh, uh, in the Innovation Lab you know, to, to figure out how we harness all, all of these um, new tools 
and still keep the integrity of the conclusions that we're, that we're actually um, uh, uh, reaching. Totally agree with the question thing, but the questions now with the pressure of more uh, near-term learning are becoming uh, shorter-term questions, and I think we've, we've got to be the stewards of longer-term learning as well. And I think that um, if I could add on to what Nancy was saying, um, you made me think of a conversation that, that we just had, uh, I guess, a couple of weeks ago within the lab, and that some of the things that we're tracking now, which are self-reported, don't correspond to sort of traditional evaluation tools or maybe even traditional monitoring tools. So, you know, in my mind, one of the most exciting trends within development, not, not a, a MEL trend, is the Right, is the social enterprise that you could have small for-profit organizations that are going to that are going to use the force of the market to drive development impact, and so because we happen to support a lot of these enterprises through some of our innovation funds, one of the things that we're using to track success is follow-on funding, right? So if we put in an initial small grant and they go out and get tens of millions of dollars of private debt and equity, like that's a validation of our model, and so we're starting to get some pretty impressive returns. So I just happened to ask. Well, have we ever like looked at their books? Like, you know, again, I have no sense at all that they wouldn't be telling the truth. But, but to get at Nancy's point, which is like we're putting it out there, and I was like, well, okay, but like we actually never—I don't know that we've ever actually asked them to prove that they've gotten the loans from the, you know, banks in Africa that they said they did, or they got the impact investment, uh, impact investors to actually write a check. And so I'm sure they did. But again, it's just sort of this brave new world, and and we don't necessarily always have the that we're not asking the right questions, or we don't necessarily have the right tools. And we are relying a lot more on self-reported data, I think, because we want answers right away. Great. Uh, at this point, why don't we open it up to questions from the audience, um, including those uh, on the webinar, which you could submit your questions via the Q&A um, widget on your screen. Uh, Carmen has a, a mic, which, given that we're recording, we'd very much like you to wait to pose your question until you have the mic in your hand. <laughs> so, um, I have a question up front. Uh, hi, my name is Becca. I work for National Disability Rights Network. Um, I had a question regarding you know, bringing the implementers into the research and evaluation uh, process. I know Mathematica recently rolled out the RCT Yes software, and I was wondering if anyone could comment on um, kind of the relationship between new technology and allowing the implementers to do their own evaluation as the process project goes. I'll comment on that. I, oh, oh, so Mathematica has recently rolled out software. It was funded by the Department of Education. It's called RCT Yes. Randomized control trial, yes. Um, and it's designed, <laughs> it's designed to help uh, programs. In particular, I think it was designed with school districts in mind, but it, programs in general, to actually be able to sort of construct, build and execute an RCT without necessarily needing the evaluation expertise that would normally be required. You know, it's kind of don't do this at home by yourself. But <laughs> there is still a need for the expertise, but it tries to set you up so that you have a good design. Um, but then to get back to your question about um, implementers using technology to do their own evaluations, I, I think in many ways that's a, a very positive thing. And I think as evaluators, um, we at Mathematica and, and our colleagues and researchers and evaluators around the world, I think we, there's still a place for us to, um, uh, y you know, advise and work with uh, organizations implementing their own evaluations. We're always trying, more and more now we get contracts to build evaluation capacity, but I think you are always, often going to bump up against the limits of the capacity of the organization, even with these great technological tools. And so I think what's important is to be mindful of what those limits are and where the expertise is is needed. It's good to have those tools, but it's also good to understand what you do and do not know, what you can and cannot do with them. Nancy, I believe that you mentioned uh, the use of technology in monitoring. Would you like to comment? Sure. And 
I mean, I think this this is such a uh, a great area to talk about. Is that how much do we really invest in empowering our partners and our grantees to uh, do their own uh, their own monitoring and evaluation? And I'm not sure that that capacity investments are growing. Um, I'd like to think that they are, and I'm I'm happy to hear that um, that they might be. Um, but I think. With, with technology, it has kind of just enabled the, we can get the answers to our questions quicker. And we have to be so careful because whether it's this decade or the decade before us, the power imbalances are still there. It's, we have to be so careful that you know, we can frame our questions. But what about their questions? What about grantee and beneficiary questions? And then how far are we actually prepared to go to invest in capacity to, uh, to enable uh, the answers to a broader range of questions than just ours. I think technology has got a fabulous role to play in that. Um, we just need to step up and uh, invest the resources into making that happen. But I, I think it does come down to facing the, uh, the power question and who are, who, who's really asking these questions. So I have just one follow-up on that, which is something that Wellspring continues to struggle with. We do support a fair amount of work in East Africa, and I have been unable over my six years at Wellspring to really find strong local capacity. And I'm at that point of being fatigued about sending in people from the global north to do work in the south. but still having trouble finding the capacity, particularly for this type of work, which isn't a one-off project, but it's, have, you know, I need people who are on retainer and who are available to NGOs for as various types of questions come up, short-term, longer-term strategic thinking, and it's just been very challenging so far to find the capacity for that. Delia, do we have any questions uh, online? We'll alternate, to be fair. <laughs> yes, yes. No, we do have a, a, several good questions online. Um, one feeds directly from um, Nancy's last comment, um, and it comes from Lloyda Earhart at PATH. Um, when, how do you balance the need, uh, donors' needs for uh, information about impact with the implementers' needs for more direct information about program implication? How does, how do you, uh, trade off these both these very important interests we need a jeopardy buzzer here <laughs> uh, yeah um, and I would add a third which is the beneficiaries as well and I think especially with the spread of mobile technology and internet and broadband access um, it really opens up huge avenues, which we're already starting to take advantage of, right, of, of having, integrating the voices of the beneficiaries themselves into both setting the questions and then helping us answer the questions. Um, you know, this might seem a little bit of a cop-out, but I would hope that as we're trying to do more learning and more research, it will um, allow the somewhat of a blurring of the power lines that Nancy was talking about. I know from a USAID perspective, because we do have a lot of real formal requirements that are oftentimes of the force of law, that there's certain things that we're just going to have to require. Um, but I would hope that as we look at more of this research and learning component, it will allow us to find a lot more common ground if there hadn't been in the past between the beneficiaries, other stakeholders, the implementers, and the funders. Just on the balance of implementation analysis and impact analysis, you know, one simplistic answer is implementation analysis should always come first, and therefore you wouldn't have to be making a trade-off if you're doing the useful analysis at the right point in the sequence. But I do want to say that I think that part of what we've shifted to is a better place, which is, yes, you don't want to do a rigorous impact evaluation without knowing that you have a mature, steady state model. So you do need implementation learning first. However, that doesn't mean that's the last time you should be focused on implementation. 
even after you have some evidence of effectiveness, I think there's still room to be testing out different approaches, efficiencies, ensuring the quality has been maintained and all of those things. So they should go hand in hand at some point down the line. I would add to that um, that you mentioned a balance, both of you, and you added the beneficiaries and the power lines that one way we have handled that um, in our role of researchers is for these decisions not to be just uh, made by the donor in collaboration with the male partner, but including the grantees in the decision making and sharing the information and the plans and having them partake in that decision making and in deciding where they are best positioned, what works best given their, where they are in implementation and where they have a role and where we are better positioned uh, to look potentially perhaps across grantees, for example, for bundles of them. Uh, but it's, it's in including them that those, those um, power boundaries can be brought down a little bit. I, I won't say entirely, but a little bit, and for them to participate. Thank you. Uh, I think we have a question. Nancy here. Can I oh. come in? This is a, a topic I feel quite strongly about. Um, I, I think there are good examples around of how this is being done, but overall, I think in the bilateral, multilateral, and even in the foundation world, we're not doing a great job of this. It's, it's pretty shameful, the trade-offs that we do make and the, the la our lack of investment in, uh, in local capacity, relatively speaking. Um, you can talk to most developing, I'm sorry, and there's a, a thunderstorm in New York, so I'm sorry if you're hearing that in the background. <laughs> um, you can talk to many developing country uh, evaluators that take courses at IPDET and various other really good uh, places, and they say, we don't have trouble getting funds to, for training. We have trouble getting places to practice. And yet we are, so if every agency and every philanthropy made a commitment to have uh, local evaluators on our team, um, we could move the needle on capacity uh, opportunity in a couple of years. And I think we need a much more joined up uh, effort on this, um, and I think we can do a lot better. I think there are great little islands of examples, but we, we, we could do better and we should do better. Thank you. Uh, I think we have a question in the back corner. Hi, I'm Melissa Chapetta. I'm the director for um, the Center for International Evaluation with APT Associates. And I have two questions. I might be exceeding my question limit, so if so, please ignore my second one. Um, but the first question is really about learning and utilization. And so I appreciate this focus on, on M&E versus MEL. And I think what we're really looking at is, is how are we using the results of our evaluations? Um, and so what I'm wondering from Josh actually and USAID's focus is I, in doing past trainings for USAID officers on evaluation, I've asked them, what is holding you up from using the results from your evaluations? And what I often hear back is two things. One of them is timing, um, because you have an inline evaluation and then your project is already starting, right? So you don't have time to incorporate that knowledge. That one I think is more difficult to deal with. The second thing that I hear is that um, they don't have the incentive to actually use the results from the evaluation. There are incentives within USAID that require evaluations of certain projects, but not necessarily requirements for use of those results. And so I'm wondering with the new policy guidance that you had mentioned earlier, if USAID is doing anything to, to try to incentivize that use. And then my second question, which I hope is quicker and easier, is just uh, related to research versus evaluation. And I appreciate, Jackie, you bringing that up because this comes up often and I get a bit frustrated with this differentiation between research and evaluation as well. But um, I have seen that USAID has MEL and MERL. And so I'm wondering if USAID can define how they differentiate research and evaluation given that impact evaluation is evaluation. So what is research? Thanks. Thank you. I'll try to be very brief. Um, so as not to exceed my answer limit. Um, 
So first of all, uh, on your first question, I actually am hopeful that we'll be able to address both the incentives and the timing. I think the timing, because we're going to have a much stronger um, uh, push towards restructuring programs to allow for adaptive management implementation, so to actually make changes not just sort of after the fact in the design, but as you're going on. And so in my mind, that's a, that will be a big incentive to actually use the evaluations uh, um, information. But then the, the second piece, uh, which is on the incentives, also um, is that we're pushing really hard on um, for uh, operating units to come up with implementation plans for how they're going to use their evaluations as part of the evaluation planning process. Um, and so we're trying to incentivize that. But there are a lot of there are a lot of incentives that exist in the USA structure, some of which including you know making sure that you're spending your money in a quick fashion and other things do make it harder sometimes to use, even if you want to, to use uh, evaluation uh, information. Um, the other question on the distinction, so I guess I would answer it two ways. One, the cute way is that you know, we throw research in, you could get Merlin, and that was, seemed important to us. Um, but I actually, um, I, the reason that we added it is because there are, we felt like there were aspects of tools and approaches for monitoring and evaluation and learning that ultimately were all aspect were research tools. Um, and that, that we thought that research was maybe a construct that could help integrate more effectively the M and the E and the L, sort of as sort of cutting across. So that was really why we were trying to emphasize the research of it is to um, recognize that you, you know, these things could all be mutually reinforcing if you had sort of a shared vision of, of, the inf of what the information would be used for, how you would collect it, and et cetera. So I think that's, that's probably the less cute answer. Thank you. Uh, we'll turn back to the online audience. So uh, William Sambisa from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation asks about, uh, can we use monitoring data for learning purposes, and, and how? Uh, really hard topic for us. Um, and it is, um, it's also a frustrating topic uh, because oftentimes monitoring data systems get created uh, without a broader framework in mind. And so what ends up happening is that they cannot be used for evaluation purposes. And so my answer to the question would be yes, it can be, but you need to think that at the very beginning. At the very beginning of your program, you need to set up a framework that's broad and that includes the different elements. That's what's powerful about MIL. It's got the monitoring component, it's got the evaluation components, and it's got the learning where we bring the research into the L with the actual work and with the dissemination and with the uses that were already mentioned. But it's all integrated, and if it's planned in that way, then monitoring data can be leveraged for evaluation purposes. But if these pieces are divorced from each other, in, at least in my personal experience, then I look at the monitoring data and I think, oh, what do I do with this? It doesn't, it doesn't help me uh, because it usually has flaws. Either it doesn't have critical pieces of information that I would need, or the most common problem is I only have participant data. I don't know who applied for the program, and so I can't create a comparison group. Um, so I would say yes, absolutely. It just has to be part of a plan design uh, at the beginning. And could I add sure. just amen to everything Clemencia <laughs> just said? Um, but I would also add that for whatever organization is setting up a monitoring system and choosing particular indicators, that they have a very intentional process for revisiting those indicators. You, you want consistency over time, obviously, but you often find that something that was useful 10 years ago is no longer useful because your population has changed, because your program has changed, whatever, but that there needs to be a really intentional and regular revisiting of the indicators to make sure that they continue to make sense. Thank you. Uh, yes, in front here. Hi, um, Stacy Young from USAID and the Policy Planning and Learning Bureau. Um, I wanted to thank you for this panel. It's been just really interesting and exciting for us to hear people talking about 
um, making evaluation work better for learning purposes. And I just wanted to add to what Josh has shared um, a little bit more on the policy side and specifically on how we're approaching learning. Um, and my colleague Kevin Smith is here also. Uh, so Kevin is also in the Policy Bureau in USAID. He's on the evaluation team. I'm on the collaborating learning and adapting team. Actually, we respectively lead those teams. Um, and Liz is a colleague, and there's some others in the room as well. Um, so I just wanted to deliver some good news, which is that um, we are cognizant of a, a broad range of constraints surrounding not only evaluation utilization, which Kevin is working a lot on, um, but also on utilization of learning generally. And so the colleague in the back who was talking about um, a timing being a constraint, we have actually taken a really systematic approach to looking at uh, the broad range of conditions that constrain us in our organizations from learning and adapting in our development planning and implementation. Um, and through that systematic analysis, we've developed policy guidance, which will be uh, finalized and released, gosh, hopefully well, September. Oh. Right, yeah, so I feel like this is the gift that we've been promising and not delivering for, for quite a while, but, it, but it's coming soon. Um, so updated guidance on the USAID program cycle, um, essentially. So this is ADS uh, 200 for those of you who speak ADS. Um, so updated guidance, as, as Josh mentioned, a stronger emphasis on uh, continuous learning and adaptive management. For those of you who might be familiar with the work that we have been um, doing around infusing organizational learning into the program cycle. We call it collaborating, learning, and adapting. Other organizations call it other things. But it really is the other side of the coin that you all have been talking about. You know, you've been talking about um, the quality of evidence and the credibility of evidence and uh, how well it's timed and is it relevant to users and also to intended beneficiaries and so on. Um, so we're looking at a, a broad set of enabling conditions as well um, that operate institutionally and constrain us from using evidence in our programs. And, and we're, we're, uh, we have really taken a systemic approach to this. So we're looking at things like um, organizational culture. So that gets to the incentives piece that we're talking about as well as openness to new ideas. And um, the, uh, the colleague who talked about um, colleagues, right, and, and the way that we interact with each other. And, and um, our uh, colleague who talked about the relationship between funders and grantees, really looking intentionally at how to reset those relationships to open up the conversation, bring more candor into the discussion about what's working and what's not. Um, so really making available a broader range of evidence and making space for it to be aired. And then intentionally focusing on specific processes that we can either leverage that are already being done uh, by missions or implementing partners or um, adding a, a small number of new processes because, of course, we're all um, time constrained uh, that, that create opportunities for people to pause and reflect intentionally and, and, and to figure out what are we learning about implementing this intervention, but also what are we learning, you know, that double loop learning around development generally. And we're also looking at resources. How well are we resourcing learning? Because that's another huge constraint. You know, if we have a mountain of data, but we lack capacity and we don't, so we don't have the staff skills or we don't have the funding that can buy more time to, to focus on that. How do we address that? Um, so all of that is, um, is addressed in uh, the collaborating learning and adapting framework. We have a, a tool that our missions use to um, assess their, their status around all of those, both the substantive learning and the enabling conditions, and to do action planning to improve it. And um, as I said, that focus on intentional systematic and resourced collaborating, learning, and adapting is something that we have been trying out for about five years now, and, and that should soon be something that is, um, is, is a required part of what, of what missions will do, and, and uh, therefore our implementing partners, from whom we've learned a great deal in this process. Thank you. Would any of the panelists like to? I just add a little bit to what Stacy said. 
Um, as far as the question about what are we doing to improve uh, our guidance, we're improving our guidance. Um, we did an evaluation utilization at USAID study, and one of the things is to improve our guidance to our, our USAID missions on, on how to do evaluations better, how to learn from them. Also, make our database, it's called the Development Experience Clearinghouse, more user-friendly, more searchable, make it easier for us to share what we've learned from evaluations for future projects. Also, improving the training for our staff, and for instance, how to manage evaluations. It starts with asking the right questions. What what in the statement of work are we going to, are we asking for and how can we evaluate an evaluation like how good is it is it giving us what we're, are we asking the right question are we getting the right product to help us make better decisions and also there's this at the, the we have a website the learning lab is an evaluation toolkit we're updating to for our missions around the world to for instance uh, track their uh, evaluation recommendations and how to keep and follow up on to make sure what we we're following up on, on what we, we realize are the best, uh, what we've learned from evaluations to do our, our activities better. Would any of the panelists like to respond? I just it's Nancy. Oh, go ahead, Nancy. Sorry. Um, thanks. Um, just t two things on the, the broader learning agenda. I think something that um, we can be doing, and we're starting to see it happen, is more meta-analysis more joined up learning. There, because many of us are investing in the same fields, um, we should be doing more joined up learning. It's starting, it's, we're starting to see that happen. But also just thinking about the trajectory of when we fund monitoring and evaluation to fund the, the giving back component of what we're learning right as part of that process. So it's not left to put something up on a website. It's actually go back to the field, convene stakeholders, um, talk about what's been learned, talk about whether any of that's relevant to them, so that we actually have a bigger and longer loop and a longer tail to what we've invested in. Yeah. I just wanted to latch on to one thing you said there, Kevin, was it, at AID? The fact that you're training your staff to manage evaluations this is such an important piece of, of making MEL work. The three parties involved, the, the funders, the evaluators, and the program folks, the grantees, we don't by nature know how to interact with each other around a learning agenda. And so actually taking time to build that capacity, we talked a bit about building um, implementers' capacity, but all three of those groups actually need to learn how to work together for this whole enterprise to really be effective. Thank you. Let's take another question from the, the web. Yes, so uh, Beatrice Pierre from USAID asks, uh, based on the panel's experience, how much do you see the quality of project design weighs in on good evaluation processes and results? <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, Depending on what your evaluation method is, your evaluation will be completely impossible if you don't have the right project design. So I think the, the lesson is always integrate the design of your evaluation with the design of the project. It almost, like, uh, you know, otherwise, um, you're kind of, you're left with maybe a lucky happenstance where your monitoring data might actually allow you to disaggregate or those things or might be asking the right question. I think particularly if we're trying to build in more learning, that's absolutely vital because um, the least effective learning in my experience as you know, someone that's been at USA for 20 years is say, oh, we really need to learn about X. Let's go back and look at all these programs and you know, interview people and key informants and read the project documents and see what we learn. And that, that, that approach rarely works. It gets you the broad platitudes like key stakeholder involvement from the beginning is really important. You know, or those sorts of things. And if you actually want to really learn stuff, you need to build into the project design the learning elements as well, not just the evaluation elements and not just the monitoring elements. So I would say you absolutely have to do it. I can give a three-word. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I can give a three-word answer, which is uh, it's critical. <laughs> I mean, quality uh, is, is what drives the learning. Without quality, we, won't, we wouldn't have um, any sort of confidence uh, in what we're learning. So, yeah, I think it would be essential. Now, that doesn't mean that it has to be 
too complicated or too costly or too difficult to do or that only people like Mathematica staff could do it uh, for it to be high quality. Uh, but, um, but I don't think quality cannot be compromised because then you don't know um, what you know. In other words, you compromise the whole learning agenda. I think I know you wanted to say something. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. It, it was me. I, I was going to say we, I think we could probably also use the very good thinking, and I'm trying to um, remember which, which um, evaluation person brought this to our field, but when we look at whether it's idea failure, design failure, or implementation failure, and really, really parse out, because I think sometimes we think, oh, well, we just haven't designed it well enough, or we haven't implemented it well enough. And it might just be that the idea, the whole theory failure around it um, is just is it, it, just not right. Um, I don't think we, we do enough to parse out those differences and to feed, to feed that back in. And I will just add on behalf of researchers and evaluators everywhere that Yes, it is tiresome when evaluation is blamed because the strategy or the program wasn't designed <laughs> correctly, and that certainly does make our jobs more difficult. Well, on, on that note, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I would like to personally thank all of the panelists today for, I think, a really fantastic discussion. I know there are many more questions, um, but I'd like to invite you all to stay for reception outside. We have some, some nice food and some, some nice drinks and um, the panelists and other folks would be more than happy to answer any questions uh, you might have. Um, perhaps we could just take a moment and thank our, our panelists. And then finally, we uh, have comment cards in each of your binders. Um, if you'd be so kind as to fill those out um, to let us know how we're doing, um, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. So and thank you all I for coming today. I would also ask the webinar audience to please complete the electronic survey that we send out. <laughs> yes, thank you, Anne. Um, so thank you all for braving the heat today and uh, joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again at the next forum.